I actually tried doing this with Crayon Physics Deluxe, which was the game that I showed in the very beginning of this talk. And the idea that I had with Crayon Physics Deluxe, this, I'm going to recap what I learned from my experiences doing that game. Uh, the idea was that if you look at uh, physics puzzle games, you have kind of two uh, different spec spectrums. You have games like these are actually totally awesome games, and there's nothing wrong with doing this type of a game. But these are uh, games that are very uh, engineering-like. There's probably uh, one or two possible solutions to a level that you have to try to figure out. And they're like more about solving these really difficult engineering problems than actually being creative. Uh, then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is sandbox games, uh, games like Fun, uh, Gary's Mod, and Lime Rider, which are all about being creative and having this fun thing to do, but they don't actually have any kind of game rules around them. They don't have any real goals in them. So the idea for Brain vs. Deluxe would be to do something that would be in between these two extremes, which would take the fun and creativity of a sandbox game and uh, take the game-like structure of other, other puzzle games. And it kind of failed. We're gonna, this is actually what I wrote in the design document when I started doing the game. Uh, the game is not about finding the right solution to the puzzle, uh, it's about finding the creative one. And I'm going to show you a quick video. What does this happen? Okay. I'm going to show you a quick video about what I mean by this. So here's a level in Cranfus Deluxe where you have to get the red ball to the star and there's a bridge in between. You have, just have to knock down the bridge and make the ball go there. Uh, the other way of solving this level, which is a bit more creative, is just using a one piece. So the player draws this one piece that's going to bring the bridge down and knock the ball over to the star. Here's some <laughs> really interesting way uh, where they built this device that actually is going to catapult the ball over the <laughs> This design didn't work, but he actually made another one, which is going to be here, which actually ended up working. This is actually pretty interesting design for this <laughs> uh, The weight of the ball is going to push it back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my idea for Crayon vs. Deluxe was to do a game that would be about the later kind of creativity, where players would actually try to solve each level in a new way. But there were a couple of problems. First of all, um, there was. How do I actually go so this slide in full screen? Does anyone know? Sorry? F5 goes to the beginning. Well, we can do this. So, uh, blah, 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 blah. So yes, the problem uh, that I had with this thing was, uh, first of all, in order for you to require players to be creative, you have to build some kind of a system that checks that when the players are being creative and solving levels in new ways, and I couldn't figure out how to build that kind of a thing, an AI system that would require players to be creative. And the second problem was the players are lazy as bastards. So, while they had the chance to build new things for each level and solve them in a new way, what they actually ended up mostly doing was that they found this one technique that would solve, uh, solve the level, like filling it out with uh, small pieces and pushing the ball over to the start. And then they would use the same one technique throughout the game for all the levels in there. So, which was kind of a shame because in that way they didn't actually get what I wanted players to get in that game. Um, I kind of knew this beforehand. Uh, and you <laughs> necessarily be interested in this. So, I think the biggest fail in Grand Fruits Deluxe for me was that uh, it lacks a system that encourages players to be creative. And, and after I finished Grand Fruits Deluxe and thought about it for a while, I kind of thought that I would be done with the whole thing. But then at GDC, um, 
2009, I attended this, a talk by Glenn Falcon uh, called, I highly recommend that you write this one down as well. Uh, it's available online on his site, and it's about uh, improvisation in games, and he goes out to define what he means by improvisation in games, and it's uh, his look on um, on things that he learned from making Park Ride 2. So up to this point, maybe you're thinking that uh, this whole game's about being creative is only meant for games where you can actually build something and do stuff like that. So what I found very interesting in Flynn's talk was that they talked about Far Cry 2, and what they wanted to do in Far Cry 2 was um, to allow players to be very creative in their solutions to the problems of killing enemies. So they would allow players to have all these different tools uh, instead of just uh, having putting them into this one pipe where they would have to go and shoot these enemies in order to progress in the game. They made this huge big open world game where they gave you these different tools to use, like they had a fire system that you could use to smoke out enemies, and they had a different wound system so you could actually shoot enemies in the leg, and when they would die they would call for other people to help, and then you could snipe them out as well. They gave you this map system that you could use to scout out really good places, and, and then they had this disease system that you actually allow diseases to get to the player, uh, to the enemies, and use all that kind of stuff. But it apparently failed really badly, because what players did was just they went and shot everything. <laughs> <laughs> and they got this really boring game. So, uh, Interesting thing is that um, I think where uh, they fail in Far Cry 2 in order to do this, all these complex systems and allow players to be creative, uh, Derek, you actually managed to do this with Spelunky. And Spelunky has all these little small rules and systems in them, like how the different enemies behave and how the different traps work and how do you use this and that. And after you start playing it, you start learning about these systems, and uh, because it's procedurally generated, you always have these new kind of situations where you have this new enemy here and this trap here that's never been, and the shopkeeper is over there, and now I can launch this trap so the rolling ball will go over and crush the shopkeeper so I can steal all this stuff. <laughs> and so you can learn a lot about these systems, and you learn to be very creative in using them in the game. So that's something to think about. Uh, so the, this whole thing isn't actually just meant for games where you can actually build things, but it's meant for other games as well. Uh -huh. So let's go on to part two, uh, making shit games. And the idea of actually part two is you have to know that it's making shit games, not about making shit games, because shit games is a totally awesome game by Mark <laughs> <laughs> But it's about making shit games, and I'm actually talking about making prototypes. Uh, prototypes are generally considered being really bad and really shitty games, but they're actually pretty interesting uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I'm not saying that doing prototypes is the only way for you to actually new games, but I'm saying that it's really worked out for me uh, for various reasons. Actually, I like to call prototyping the foreplay of game development. <laughs> and the reason why I call it the foreplay of game development is because most guys want to skip this part. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how do I got into prototyping? Well, back in 2006, I was uh, basically a hobby game developer. I had never really released anything. Uh, I had worked on a couple of different games in my free time. And I've, I've been working on this one game for almost two years back then. And in 2006, I read about the experiment of the gameplay project by these awesome dudes. And their idea was that they would create a new game every week that would test some kind of new gameplay mechanic. And they ended up making a ton of totally awesome games. And in 2006, I tested one of them out, which was Gravity Head by Kyle Gabler. And this game is about this uh, boy who has uh, the mass of Earth uh, in his head. So his head, head is really heavy. And he tries to impress this girl by throwing roses at her. And uh, he has to use his head and the gravity to 
fields in order to get roses to the girl. And the game has this totally 